like you're already doing, okay? Now notice, Ephesians. Someone said the world's greatest expert on raising children is the person who does not have any of their own. <laughs> At least they think they're experts. <laughs> Our passage is a continuation of the fruit result of those believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul explains how it affects our, we've seen, our worship, our marriage, our family, that's tonight, our employment, that's tonight. That should be uh, verses 5 through 9 there. That's my mistake. And our spiritual warfare that we'll begin to look at next week. We'll be on that for a while. The theme about our first verse is about our family. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayst live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In verse 1, we see that believing children, and by the way, believing children are different than unbelieving children, right? They're... There's a great, there should be a great difference there. Are to hear, learn, and respond by obeying, by obeying their parents. Kids are to place themselves under their parents' authority, wishes, rules, and commands. Everybody said? It is vital for them to learn this at an early age. Doing this, they will be more apt to follow God, His Word, and other authority that they will be under in their lives. There's all kinds of authority that they will have to be subjective to and submissive to. Subjected to and submissive to. Isn't that correct? in their life and so if they don't learn it early they're going to have some real problems correct I mean they will have some real problems two this is right Paul says what a politically incorrect thing to say today that the kid would be under their parents authority society today has reversed what God says to what their humanistic opinion says. Parents, obey your children. Let me just say something to you. Psychology has completely run public education. That is just a fact. It is just nonsense what you see on TV. The teacher's just standing there while this kid is beaten up on the girl and he's saying the girl bullied him. It's amazing. I remember younger, this one girl, she was muscular and everything. She was always mean, and she was chasing me down the alley, and I turned around and hit her as hard as I could. <laughs> we fell in love for a couple of weeks by then. <laughs> Today, there is hardly any moral absolutes, and kids have their own rights. We're Romans chapter 1 society today. That's exactly who we are. And God's given us up to that. And anything goes today, isn't it? Somebody was, I think John Hall was telling me that the Girl Scouts have approved transgenders, the fellas turning into girls and stuff like that, you know, uh, okay for the Girl Scouts now. And that's, the, that's our world today, isn't it? Notice B. But as believers, we know God's word is always absolute. There are things that are right and things that are wrong. We should influence our kids to listen to truth, hear it, then obey us as their parents in that truth. I think the sad thing today is we see a lot of churches bending on the absolute truth. And they're going the other way to make it 
appeasing to go to their services where the person is not condemned for doing anything wrong. And uh, we're having a lot of that. God has set up the home family structure with the parents in charge and responsible. We've seen 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it is 11.3, uh, where you have God, the Father, Christ, the man, the lady, the children. They're at, exactly, thank you. And there you see that's the structure that we should follow. And the children are to be under the parents, that's for sure. See, God is saying that it is just, it is just fair and equitable considering what the parents do for them. But the main reason that children should obey their parents is that God has decreed it. Just like this morning we learned about Cain and Abel, God decreed a certain way to approach him to be accepted. When you go against that, there are consequences. And it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. You know, you have to obey God. And... Uh, now, understanding that God is fair and God is a good God, and God loves us, and he has reasons for those parameters, those standards that we are to be under and follow. And that's where our trust and our faith comes in, isn't it? Honor thy father and mother. A, eh? this means that children are to value their parents, honor them as important and worthy. Honoring parents is a step higher than obedience. It is going that extra mile to highly esteem them for bringing, bringing us into this world for all the sacrifices they have made for us. It's unbelievable the sacrifices parents go through just for their children. And I don't think sometimes kids really appreciate that like they should appreciate that. Uh, my mom sacrificed because she's, you know, by herself. Dad took off. And so, I mean, she did so much for us just to try to survive. And you can't ever repay that. And, uh, but they do sacrifice so much. They do without so children can have even. I never had a Corvette because of my dirty, rotten children. <laughs> I'm kidding. For all the sacrifices they have made for us, and if imparting God and his word as parents, all the more honor to them. If I had a mom and dad that gave me the word of God and, and planted that in my heart, all the more honor they should receive. Okay? See, actually, obedience is as long as one is under his parents' roof. Honor is to be a lifelong pursuit even after they pass away. Amen? You know, every day when I'm in my office, when I leave, I have a bunch of pictures and I go through each one of my family members, and I pray for them and so on. And the first ones are Kurt and Charlotte's mom and dad and my mom. And I say, Lord, may I make them proud. That's what I, I pray that every day for. Regardless of how well or how bad our parents did in the Lord, we always show respect and uphold our family name. That, in turn, continues to honor parents. Huh? Now, this next statement is so true. I am sure most of us older parents would have liked to have done some things differently than what we did. Huh? Wouldn't you like to go back and undo some things you did? That is normal. 
it is what it is, so accept God's grace and move on. <laughs> Don't let the devil put you on a guilt trip that always keeps you living in the past rather than where you are right now and going forward. Accept the grace of God. It's there. It's greater than all of our sin, even. Huh? Four, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Eh? Paul here gives some promises to those children who honor and obey their parents. One, God says they have the potential to have a blessed, favored by God and man life. In other words, God honors the children who try to follow him and be obedient to his word, right? He honors them. The promise was to Israel if they were obedient to the Lord, but it is a principle. That's why Paul's using it. Still for submissive children to parents. Paul is repeating the fifth commandment to teach us that under grace there are great principles of the law that we can use today. Amen? Uh, the law was holy. And so there are some great principles that we can use in our everyday life. You can read Joshua there sometimes, that thou mayest prosper. Two, God says they have the potential to have a long life. We understand that bad things can happen to end life prematurely. But as the norm, the rules and instructions given by parents to warn, guide, and obey helps children to avoid wrong friends, wrong places, wrong activities, and to live God's will for their life. Now, let me just say that we can try to influence. We can try to be the examples and, and challenge them and warn them and encourage them and everything. But the final decision is still their choice what they're going to do with it. And because they have an old Adamic nature, sometimes they choose what's wrong, even though they're in a godly home. Huh? It's just the first family, Cain and Abel, same parents, huh? one good, one bad. Esau and Jacob, same family, <laughs> same home, one bad, one good. Huh? Same environment. So you can't make them do it. That has to be their decision. And we'll talk about how to bring some of that about. But notice Proverbs. Uh, this is great for us. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them up on the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And then verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him. And what's the results? And he shall direct thy paths. And then where it's underlined, verse 7, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. If you live the right way, you can be blessed, you can be favored, you can have longer life. But if you choose the other way, it's just the opposite of those blessings. Right? Okay? Five. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Eh? Fathers need to be careful and wise in how they correct their children. This is so that they do not create anger, resentment, and even rebellion within their children's hearts. Have you ever seen that? A parent do that to his kids? 
kids just say, I just hate them. I just can't wait to get away from them. B, many parents place unreasonable, legalistic, controlling demands on their children which frustrate and smother their spirits. Parents that are always writing their kids to the point that their kids resent that they are their parents are only pushing them in the wrong direction. Parents are to encourage their children to do their best in all they do. If they are a B or C student, don't demand an A. <laughs> Some of us are slower than others. I, I is. <laughs> Always be in their corner, showing your love for them. They should never have any doubt about that, no matter what. Children should always know that you love them, regardless. When a father fails to be consistent in life and in the correction of his children, he sends the wrong message to his kids, leading to confusion. The father is inconsistent, then acts in a law, L-A-W, law-like fashion, demanding instant obedience. This only provokes his children. He is saying, do as I say, not as I do. That is hypocrisy. Huh? Hypocrisy. Saying one thing, doing something else. D, I believe kids actually want to know what is required of them and their boundaries. They also will push those boundaries to see how far they can go before the parent is, is firm. Isn't that true? You can, this, are you allowed to do this? Someone's like, just the edge, always on the edge or whatever. You know, that's human nature. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. <laughs> so uh, I just think it's human nature to try to push to the edge how far you can get. E, remember, using law or legalism is forced obedience. But grace, not license, causes the child to obey out of devotion his heart and freedom to be and do right. You know, the dad can be legalistic and say, this, I'm the dad, this is why, blah, blah. And he's inconsistent in his own life. He's demanding obedience. He's not obedient to God. And on and go, he uses the law. He uses the law. He uses legalism. He uses his preferences. And he forces and he forces and he forces. And the moment that kid gets outside of his reach, he'll go the opposite way. That's just automatic. Isn't that true? If you can get their heart, uh, and he wants to do it out of devotion, that's when there's transformation. You can see that verse there, the grace of God, and then verse 12, teaching us. The grace of God teaches us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace teaches us to live godly. Some people say, well, grace gives you license. No, that's, never, that's not true. Grace teaches us how to be Christ-like, and that's godly. Six, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up. This means to raise them to maturity. As long as they are under their parents' roof, God places the 
R-E, responsibility to train and to educate them upon the parent's shoulders. Now listen to this next one. It is not the schools, the states, the governments, or even the church's responsibility to raise your children. It is dad's and mom's. Amen? Two, parents are to take the time and inconvenience to train their children through the stages of their development. Psalm says, Lo, children are a pain in the neck of the Lord. <laughs> Doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> they're, they're a heritage, okay? Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. To train means to mold, to mold character within them, to exercise them, to form godly habits, and to create obedience in them to authorities. It is the bending of their will, that old man in them, to what God wills. You know, as soon as your child is born, the process begins. The old man's way or the godly way. And you have to begin as soon as a baby's born, they start crying. Huh? They want their way. Don't feed them for about two minutes. <laughs> they start screaming and crying, and boy, they want their way, don't they? It's funny. We had our great granddaughter the other day, and she started throwing a fit, you know. You put that bottle in her mouth, bam, she was just a still. She knows how to get her way. <laughs> now, notice the word nurture. This refers to the children's training, education, instruction, discipline, and correction. The Greek words together include spanking. Isn't that amazing? You know what they should have done at that school the other day? Just taking that kid and getting in there and just burn his fanny. Huh? They can't, the teacher's hands are tied. They just look at him, say, stop, don't do that. Please, stop. Boy, I used to march in my principal or vice principal's office and they said, bend over. Ha! <laughs> Man, they had a big bet on the thing. He said, I love golf. <laughs> Man, he let me have it, boy. It didn't hurt me. It hurt then, but it didn't hurt me here. Notice, you know, the Bible says, foolishness is found in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And let me just say, so I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about if you do it right, you don't have to do it very often. Yeah, I just wear them out, and I watch them, they go over. I said, say, here's my belt, do it properly. Proverbs 13, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times, many times. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Huh? The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You remember there in Baltimore when that mom went over there and grabbed her son out of the crowd? She's just whipping on him, wasn't she? Slapping him. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Kids are great. They start screaming and crying, hoping that that will prevent you from doing any more. Isn't that correct? Verse 17, correct thy son, he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Verse 30, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. 
So do stripes and inward parts of the belly. Of the blueness of a wound. How about that? Huh? Sounded like you gave him a pretty good little licking. Back in the old days, Carol said to uh, her dad that she had to go out and get a, it was a switch from a willow tree, Carol? Yeah, that thing go sting. Leave welts. You deserved it, though, Pat. I, I, just, I, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> How many of you used to get spankings? Let me just see your hands. Uh, and you're still living. Isn't that amazing? Now, we're not talking about abuse. You know that. You know, for a parent to abuse their children just demonstrates they have no clue how to solve a problem. You know what I mean? Notice on page four now. We know it takes creativity and love it needs to be balanced you know there are different ways to punish your children chasing them we understand that but when all else fails let her rip you know if you do this 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 happens and if you do something this bad this happens you know you can be creative I understand that admonition this refers to putting in the mind. The other was putting in the behind. This is putting into the mind. Okay? Parents are to give them, our kids, information through themselves and others, the knowledge of right and wrong, godly and ungodly, the words view, W-O-R-D, so on, versus the world's view. Everything necessary that they will need to know for life. And especially in their own personal relationship with God. His word and will. I see today that a lot of Christian parents try to protect their children so much they almost hide them from life. It's just like we do everything. I'm, I have to watch this. I enjoy this right here. I enjoy that, getting the handshakes off, getting the germs off and stuff, you know. But sometimes you need some germs to build your immune system, you know, with limitations, of course. And sometimes we protect our children so much that when it's time for them to step out in life, they have no clue. And it doesn't take much to take them down. Notice here, here's some ideas, okay? Give your kids love and time. In other words, be there for them. It takes time to know them, to listen to them. If you don't listen to them, how in the world are you ever going to know what they need? The average father spends, this is amazing to me, in the presence of their children, seven and a half minutes of one-on-one -on -one or talking to them or whatever per week. That's the average. That's wild, isn't it? B, help them to learn to apply their life to God's word. 2 Peter 1, 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertains unto life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. God's given us everything we need to know and understand through his word. Now make that application so that their life can be, what? Strong and mature. See, give them your faith for saving and living. And the only way you can give them your faith 
is you demonstrate by your example that it is real and genuine in your own life. That's the best testimony they could ever watch and observe is mom and dad living it. D, challenge them to make a spiritual contribution, something for God. You know, when God saved us, God gave us a gift, at least one. Some people have multiple gifts. And there's a reason he gifted. He said it's for the body. And God wants us to use the gifts to do something for him. I don't care if it's sweeping a floor, whatever it may be, or whether it's playing in the band, singing in choir, Sunday school teacher, greeter, whatever it might be. You know, a lot of people don't have the gift of hospitality. Some people are greeters. <laughs> Boy, we really influence those people. I don't think we'll ever see them again, will we? <laughs> but, you know, if you have that personality, you know, that's a gift. Use it. But only what's done for Christ will last people when we stand before him. Only what we've done for him, that will even count. And it's teaching them it's not about just us. Kids today, life revolves around them. And they have to learn it doesn't revolve around them. Others, I quoted that little poem many times. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my model be. Help me to live for others that I might be like thee. Notice E, teach them to have a godly fear of God. If they don't respect and reverence God, they won't respect or reverence any type of authority. You know, they'll try to get by, they get their own way. F, show them how to recognize and resist the devil. Uh, one of the ways, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Get around other believers. Neither give place to the devil. Kelly, pull up, uh, well, it's in your Bible there, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, Kelly. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. I wrote that down on my note here. We want our kids to be aware and not naive. If you don't know the devils are coming after you, you won't be ready for them. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We begin that next week. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, trickery, deception of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. That's a real battle that every child of God fights. And if a kid doesn't understand that, they are vulnerable, they are open, and they can be hit and taken down badly. Okay? We owe it to them. G, show them how to cry out to God in time of need. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Show them by example. H, explain God's umbrella. U-M-B-R-E-L-L-A. Umbrella of protection and blessings. We shared that before. You, as long as you're under the umbrella of God's will, God's word for your life, you're going to be blessed, favored, and so on. But if you step outside that umbrella of God's will and blessings and that, you're going to get wet. You're going to get hit by what the world, the flesh, and the devil throws your way. I pray for them daily. Now, what do we pray for our kids? Here's a couple of things. One, that they will have a hatred of sin. Notice Psalm says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Hate evil. Look at the cons Show them the consequences. The devastation of sin. 
Take them down to the jailhouse sometime. Let them walk through. Let some of the inmates say something to them. Why are you here? <laughs> Two, we pray for them that they will be caught when guilty. It is, a good, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. You know, when they get caught, when they're guilty, that's a learning time. And one of the things that just, I won't say infuriates me, is that wrong? But upsets me or bewilders me, frustrates me, is to continually see parents bail out their kids. Over and over and over and over. Usually it's always somebody else's fault. Oh, I know I shouldn't do this, but let them sit and rot for a while. Huh? It might be the best thing for them. It shows and teaches them there are consequences when you do wrong. I've told some of the old times before, I remember when I was young, the old Danner's store there at Fountain Square. I, st I stole a brooch. It was, it was my foster mom's uh, birthday, and I stole that and gave it to her for her birthday. What I didn't know, that very day, she had been in there looking at that brooch. What's that verse? Be sure your sin will find you out. She said, how much did that cost? I said, oh, just a little bit, not much. I, I had a little something. She said, sit down here. <laughs> so she made me, went with me. I had to go back to the store owner and give it back to him and told him that I had taken it. Boy, I learned a great lesson there. I, I, <laughs> you thought, oh, it's hard. I was just a little kid, young, youngster. Three, you pray that they will be protected from evil. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should, shouldest keep them from the evil. From the world's allurements, the flesh's passions, the devil's devices. Four, that they have a good attitude in their relationships. Some kids are so depressing to be around. And then they wonder why they can't get a job. <laughs> you know, I put Daniel down there, 6'3". Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. There's something that stood out in a positive way that overshadowed these other sour pusses. Amen? Another prayer, five, that they will reverence, R-E-V-E-R-E-N-C-E, -E -E, reverence God and respect authority. Listen, if they will not respect God, I said a while ago, they will not respect authority. When they go out there in the world, if they don't respect that authority, that authority will beat them into submission. But they will be beaten by it. They'll be hurt by it. They'll be taken down by it. It's better to learn how to, what? Honor that authority, respect it. Six, that they will choose the right kind of friends. Let every, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Hope deferred maketh heart sick, but when the desire comes, I don't know what that is. That's the wrong one. It should be 1812, I think, Kelly. I'm not sure. Am I wrong on that? I don't know. But anyway, you know, uh, is the old saying, show me your friends and I'll, no, that's not it. That's okay. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Okay, with the kids. Who they run with is who they become. Most kids today are groomed by the godless public education. And let me just say that I know there are some good teachers. Thank God for them. But boy, they're fighting an uphill battle themselves of trying to be good godly teachers, aren't they? But overall, the godless public education or society's satanic system 
only a parent who purposely, who purposely puts godly things into the minds and behavior of their children has the ability to override our world's untruth and darkness. The only kids going to have a chance are those that that seed has been planted in their minds and their hearts. Will they stand when it's time to stand and make it? Now, Jay, just another idea. Just keep it simple and uncomplicated. Now, what do I mean by that? Notice how. One, remind ourselves that our children are a gift from God. They are our heritage. They are our legacy. They are to be arrows that influence and impact. Two, enjoy the differences in each one. Every one of our children are unique individuals, and they're all different. It's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, they are so different. And our kids aren't to be clones. We try to conform him to this one. Each kid's different. One might be an IT freak. Another one might be a music one, and so on and so on. But each child is different. Just like they say, every snowflake is different. So is every child. Three, spend time with each of our children individually. When you do that individually, you're saying to them, you love them individually. If you're a man, take your son out for a meal, just you and him. Take him to a ball game, just you and him. If it's a girl, mom, take him out. Dad, take her out for a date. Show them how much you love them. Four, help them to become readers, readers of good material in God's Word. That's so that they can become well-rounded. I remember down in Greenville, Mississippi, they were trying to get me into school down there, and uh, I remember sitting on the, in the chair going, well, I think, you know, you know, I was the dumbest idiot you ever seen. It was amazing. A lady's daughter was a genius, and they said, how come she's a genius? And mom said, I read the dictionary to her every day while she was in my womb. Isn't that amazing? Five, make good music a part of their life. Perhaps they're gifted, an instrument, singing, whatever, the right kind. But helping them begin to learn how to appreciate all types of good music, whether it's secular, religious, gospel, whether it's hymns, contemporary, good songs. I have good messages to them, and so on, but to appreciate. I, can, I love sometimes opera to highbrow to lowbrow. <laughs> it's good. We used to go, always go see Johnny Mathis when he came in town. And, uh, or uh, the piano player. What was his name, Carol? No, uh, the one played that. Roger Williams. Roger Williams, when he'd come in town and things like that. I mean, it, kids need to learn good music. Six, create projects the family can work on together. Gives them a sense of togetherness, accomplishment. Seven, give kids responsibility so they learn to work and not be lazy. Today, too many kids want handouts. Amen? And when they do some work, give them high praise. Huh? Number eight, take trips or vacations together. It's a great bonding time. We used to love, we used to get the kids, take down for one week, go down to St. Pete. we go down there and get a little motel on the ocean there, one of the mom and pop's places that they had, and it was great. Didn't you like it, Carol? 
You didn't like it? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, every time we went on vacation, we were wondering what kind of Mother Nature storm was coming our way. We were in Chattanooga or uh, in uh, Gatlinburg. You have an earthquake. We're in Florida. We had a hur hurricane, and then we had tornadoes. And uh, last time we went with kids down to uh, Florida, uh, there were water spouts and tornadoes coming on our street. It was great. It was exciting. So everybody used to call me up and say, where are you going on vacation? They were going in the opposite direction. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Number nine, teach kids how to handle money and to appreciate possessions. Now, when we were first married, Kara was so much better than me at this. She's tremendous at it. I always remember Dr. Jerry Ben. Uh, he was my professor at school, then he became uh, president of Bible College up in London, Ontario, and then pastor of church and so on. And uh, his kid, he taught his kids how to shop, how to do checking, accounting, on and on it goes. Unbelievable the way they did it. Ten, have standards of difference. Now get this. Have standards of difference between social laws and God absolutes. Kelly, pull up Acts 5, 27 through 29 for me. We place ourselves under the word of God, under the authorities that God's placed us, but sometimes social laws conflict with God's laws. What do you do? Then came one and told them, saying, one of the religious leaders, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest, asked them, just keep on going, Kelly, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, What? We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen? You have your social laws, you're under, but when they say it conflicts with the word of God, we obey God and not man. And our kids need to know that difference. It's just like our president, he wants Christians to be more loving and merciful against gays, against abortion, against those things that is contrary to the word of God. Yes, I know we're supposed to love, but we're not to violate what God says is sin. Huh? He's asking us to sin. Uh, no, no, we don't do that. All of this helps children to mature physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, I'm just going to give you the answers here, okay? This is about relationship of a servant and his master. Just number one. God is not condoning, is not condoning slavery here. However, because of the entrance of sin into the world, the Bible recognizes less than ideal conditions among fallen humans. So God here explains how to deal with these situations between servants and masters. Two, in those days, slavery was universal. Victorious nations, Roman Empire, made slaves of their captives. Matter of fact, at one time, Rome had more slaves than citizens. Note, even under the Jewish law, slavery was permitted. At times, Hebrews were sold as servants. But at the end of seven years, the servants were to go free and were given an overflowing supply of goods by their masters. You can read those verses sometime. It's, it's interesting. B, even sometimes the servant 
would come to love his master and did not want to leave. So he would go through a ceremony that would make him a permanent, per, P-E-R, perpetual servant. Deuteronomy says, And it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee and thine house, because he is well with thee, then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever, and also unto thy maidservant, Thou shalt do likewise. This is a beautiful picture of the believer becoming a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Just remember, the vast majority, 98% of those servants, had no education or could not build up a profession. The masses were totally incapable of running a business or producing products. So the most comfortable area for them was working for someone. And by the way, have we changed that much? We still have our masters, right? Hey, if once master was benevolent, he would provide housing, food, and a job. Life could be enjoyable. B, but if the slave master was controlled by his own old nature, greed, and the devil, the slave endured a horrible life. Paul teaches how believing masters and believing servants were to behave toward one another. Paul wanted those servant believers to consider that their labor was to honor God. In doing that, Paul promised them that God would not forget to reward them. Their work was not in vain since it pleased God. Paul was trying to get them, instead of just focusing always on what you're going through here, remember you're doing it unto the Lord. And as a result of that, you'll be rewarded for that to make it more bearable. Hebrews 6, you can read that sometime. B, but Paul also had a word to the masters, believers, believing ones. Anyone who is in position of authority over others also has a master over them in heaven. God is not respecter of person. It doesn't matter to him that you're a master. One, masters have a greater responsibility than those who are servants. Those who have been favored with wealth and power will be held more accountable before God. Masters were to treat their slaves or servants right, fair, and graciously. As servants will not be forgotten by God, God will punish masters who mistreat their servants, they will be repaid equally, good for good and punishment for evil. Paul says, but he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of person. So Paul here in verses 5 through 9 gives the standards for a good worker and a good boss. And in these verses, he breaks it down. We can even use it for us and our employer. A good worker. One, he follows orders. Hello? That's a good worker. It's not his business. It's your employer's business. Two, he shows respect to his boss. And those verses, you can read that sometime. The last page, one of the worst things is to put down your boss constantly. You've been on jobs, I've been on jobs where nothing but just complain about the boss and put them down, put them down, put them down. You ever been around that? Three, he is loyal. In other words, 
a good worker, his boss can count on him. He'll be there for you. Verse 6, he needs little supervision. In other words, the boss trusts him, and he's a self-starter. Isn't it awful that you have to tell somebody to, how to do every little thing? If you tell them how to do every little thing, you don't need them. Huh? Another good sign, a good worker, he has a good attitude, a good one. And then verse 8, he knows his God will reward him. Do you know something? God, he holds us accountable how we live our life, how we work. Do we give our employer a good day's energy? On and on it goes. A good boss, he returns, he returns Respect, loyalty, and honesty. Verse 9, he does not threaten, but uses positive motivation. When you threaten and you force, like some people don't know how to handle authority, and they force it, it's not real in the person. You know what I mean? instead of creating in them the desire to do a good job. Three, he knows he will answer to God. In the broader context, Paul is showing the principles of submission and headships as they pertain to the body church, worship, the family tonight, and job site. The proper behavior only comes when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Only when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit will I want to do it God's way. Huh? Only then will I try to be a good boss a good employee.